All right, the time is 601, so we will get started. Uh, hello everyone once again. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on all you need to know about H1B visa. My name is Vishal Sharma and I'm your host for tonight. Today I'm joined uh, by Prashanti Reddy. Uh, Prashanti is a distinguished lawyer. Uh, she, she has been practicing uh, in the field of immigration since 1997. She is uh, an alumni of uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, she has been admitted to uh, the bar in New York, and uh, she's a member of the American Immigration Lawyer Association and the New York Bar Association. Other than that, she is also actively involved in many volunteer uh, capacity, and uh, she is currently involved in uh, pro bono legal work as well. Uh, so to take you further, I would like to introduce you to Prashanti Reddy. Prashanti, over to you. Hi, uh, thank you, Vishal, for that uh, warm welcome. Uh, let's go right ahead. Um, and people will, I think, I guess, you know, join in slowly. Uh, Indian Standard Time. So <laughs> <laughs> let's. So um, just to start off with um, a recap on, you know, what happened this year with the H-1B cap 2023. Um, as you all know, the cap is closed um, and they received enough numbers to uh, close the cap. So. Uh, USCIS announced that they received 483,927 petitions. Compared to 300,000, 350,000 petitions last year, it's about 200,000 petitions more than last year. So they selected 127,600 uh, petitions, um, but keep in mind, uh, there are only 85,000 uh, H-1B cap numbers every year. Uh, but they selected more because uh, they wanted to keep in mind, uh, uh, you know, all those cases that were not, uh, some cases people file registrations, but they don't actually file the petitions. So they wanted to select, you know, more cases so that they could compensate for those cases that were registered but not filed. Um, so it turned out that the pick percentage was about 26%, which is much, much lower than last year. Um, so this is telling uh, on, you know, what the demand is for H-1Bs uh, and how the economy is suffering because obviously the U.S. companies have a need for these talented um, professionals and um, they don't have uh, enough people here in the U.S. They don't have enough U.S. citizens and permanent residents to fill that gap. So what's happening is Requirements are either closing down, they're opening in the IT sector. I'm talking mainly about the IT sector, but this could apply to healthcare and you know finance and almost every other sector. So what's happening is requirements are opening up, and then they're not finding anyone, and then they just close down, uh, or they ship the job you know to Mexico or India or Philippines or somewhere else. So um, no matter what happens, uh, it's the U.S. economy that is suffering, U.S. companies that are suffering. So, you know, just to advocate either to remove the H-1B cap numbers, I think it's important to do that, to advocate that, or to at least increase the cap numbers. Um, the In my memory, the only time the cap numbers were increased is during Clinton's time, during the Y2K, you know, uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, that's when the cap, they increased the cap numbers for uh, a certain period of time, and then it went back to 85,000. So out of the 85,000 cap numbers, um, you have 20,000 that are masters, open for masters uh, degree holders, and you have 20, 25, so, and then you have 65 that are open for bachelor's um, degree holders. So there are two different um, picks, two different lotteries that take place. The first time around, only masters cases are picked, and then the second uh, pick is both masters as well as um, the bachelors. So as you saw, 26% very low pick rate, pick rate. So now that the cap has been met, um, you know, people have all filed their petitions. We were hoping that there would be one more lottery. Um, last year, there were three lotteries. So there were three picks because, you know, the first time 
they were not people were selected, but they didn't file, so they didn't have enough um, cases to fill up the quota. So they did a did a second pick and then they did a third pick. This year they only did one pick, and their reasoning seems to be that they selected enough people in the first round uh, to compensate for those people who you know didn't actually file. So that's that's why we didn't have any further picks. So now that you know, and so the deadline to file the H1B was June ending. So most of you would have filed your H1. Uh, and um, now you can expect either an, an RFE or you can expect uh, an approval. So let's talk about what happens in what circumstances you get an RFE and what you can do to avoid RFEs or what you can do to respond uh, properly to an RFE. You can go to the next slide, please. Sure, and just a gentle reminder for uh, everyone joining in, you will get an opportunity to ask questions by the end of the presentation, uh, and then you will get the opportunity to either type in your question and send it to us uh, via chat, or by the end of the presentation, we will have a little window where we will uh, enable you to speak. So you can raise your hand or just let us know that you want to talk and uh, we will let you in. On that note, I'll move to the next slide. Thank you. So one of the most important reasons why you would get an RFE is with reference to the speciality occupation. So the most common, that's the most common reason. So the criteria to get a H1 is that you should uh, work in a speciality occupation, which means that you should work in an occupation that requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree in a specific field. So just saying that a Bachelor of Arts is required for the position is not a specialty occupation. If the position only requires a Bachelor of Arts degree, the position should, for example, require a bachelor's in computer science or something specific, bachelor's in marketing for that particular position to qualify for a specialty occupation. Not only that, um, the beneficiary or the, the employee should qualify for the position, which means that the beneficiary should then have a bachelor's in computer science or uh, or related. Um, so this is very important. So you have to make sure even before filing the petition that you qualify for a specialty occupation. And this has been changing <clears throat> in the recent past. They've often modified or reinterpreted what specialty occupation means uh, and Currently, um, though uh, it, the interpretation seems to have become a little bit more liberal, but compared to the past and you know in the year, the last year and the year before, they had really narrowed down the interpretation of specialty occupation, and they continue to do that a little better, but they still continue to do it. And what they are basically saying is that if the position requires a bachelor's degree in more than one uh, major. So, for example, if I said a systems analyst position is the opening in my company and I require a bachelor's degree in computer science, business administration or math. Now, USCIS interprets that to mean that it's not a um, uh, specialty occupation because it's not the requirement is not a bachelor's degree in a specific quote unquote specific field because it's three different fields. So that is, of course, a wrong interpretation of what the regulation says. As long as it's related and as long as it makes sense, it doesn't have to be one single major. It can be several majors, but anyway, that's how they've been interpreting it. And as a result of which, you know, some occupations have become very difficult. Uh, and the example is the systems analyst or market research analyst. You know, these occupations have become very difficult to get a H1 approved because um, as per industry standards, there is a wide variety of uh, majors that you can have to qualify um, in these uh, for these jobs. Next slide. So uh, in addition to speciality occupation, the availability of work is another reason why USCIS sends out RFEs. And so they want to make sure that the job that they're giving you, that it's not speculative. So they can't say that, OK, I will get this person from India, this this uh, a software engineer from India, and once I get them here, then I will market them. So they cannot, you cannot do that. You cannot market uh, the candidate and find a job for them 
after you bring them here. You have to already have a job for them. So that's very important. Uh, and in order to show that you have a job at the time of filing the petition, now this might be difficult, especially if you're filing for a H1 for a person who's in India, because uh, who's going to give a job to a person without actually interviewing them and most often in person? So if especially if you're a consulting company and you, you know, you have a client who wants to hire someone, they'd want to interview that person, uh, you know, uh, face to face, and that might not be possible if the person is in India. And so you may not be able to file for that person unless you are not only a consulting or staffing company, but you also have a product. And so you require someone to work for you in house in your office to develop that particular product. So, imp so important to uh, note that the employee should be engaged in specific non speculative work, and this this has to be established at the time of filing. So that's um, so that's another reason why our USCIS sends RFEs. And so in order to avoid those RFEs, what we usually do is we submit proof of work. So we submit um, if you're if you have a client and the person is going to be working for a client, we submit um, master service agreements, SOWs, POs, uh, letters from the vendor, letters from the end client, um, basically stating that you know this job has been offered to that particular beneficiary and you know these are the duties etc so the, those letters serve two purposes they help to establish what the job description is because for specialty occupation you know the job description um, has to require a bachelor's degree and should also the job duties another way of showing specialty occupation is show that, to show that the job duties are complex uh, and require a bachelor's degree. So that is uh, established by a job description from the end client. That's the best way of establishing what the job duties are straight from the horse's mouth. So um, that's why we submit those documents uh, in order to show availability of work as well as specialty occupation. Next slide, Vishal. Uh, beneficiaries qualification, as we discussed, not only does the uh, H1 or the job have to show that um, you know the uh, job requires a bachelor's degree in a specific field, but you also have to show that the beneficiary has that particular degree that um, that is required by the employer. And in order to prove that, uh, the certain documents have to be submitted. And if those documents are not submitted, you might get an RFE. So how do you um, submit those documents? You might think it's easy. Just submit the degree copy. It's not that easy, but sometimes it can be complicated. Number one, if the person has, say, a bachelor's degree in computer science, pretty straightforward, right? If you're filing for a software engineer, not really, because you have to submit an evaluation of that degree if that degree is a foreign degree, if it's not from a US, um, a US um, college. So an evaluation from an independent evaluator, evaluator stating that it's equivalent to a bachelor's degree in the United States. We all know that degrees in India sometimes can be three years. Undergrad degrees in India and degrees in the US are four year degrees, so uh, they want you to equate it and make sure that it's equivalent to a US bachelor's degree. That's why the evaluation. Also, they evaluate the program. The evaluators evaluate the university that it's from, so they want they evaluate all these things and make it the equivalent of a US bachelor's. So that's important. Get an evaluation done. Sometimes they may not qualify based on um, the bachelor's degree, based on their education alone. It could either be because it's a three-year degree and the US requires a four-year degree, or it could be that you know it's the major is different. Like they have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, whereas the requirement is a bachelor's in computer science as per industry standards. So what would you do then? You would get an, a work experience evaluation done which means you would combine, you would ask the evaluator to combine the education and the person's work experience. Usually three years of work experience is equivalent to one year of college. So if they had a bachelor's degree in some other field or they had a three year bachelor's degree, then if they had three years of work experience and they were able to get a experience letter and other documentation, the evaluator would combine those two and give an educational and experience uh, work evaluation, a combined 
education and experience evaluation, and uh, they would have the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in computer science. So it's important to uh, note these things. Also, sometimes they may not have experience, so they might have a bachelor's in a closely related field. So it's up to us to show that that field is closely related. Don't presume that USCIS will know. Uh, the onus uh, uh, is on us to show that you know it's related. <clears throat> For example, sometimes you might have an MBA degree, but it might be in information systems. You'd have to show, so it's important then to document through by, by enclosing the transcript and then writing or highlighting the courses that are related or putting a table maybe of courses related versus the job description and which job requires which course and how how their education is related to the job that they're doing. So though it seems simple, uh, sometimes it might not be so additional work may be required to, to show that the beneficiary is qualified for the position. Next slide. Maintenance of status. Now this also <clears throat> might seem obvious that yes, unless you're in status, how can you then um, file for an extension of status if you're filing for an extension of your H1 or transfer uh, or change of status? So uh, many a times RFEs are issued for maintenance of stat status. It could be that uh, maybe you did not, it should, could be as straightforward as maybe you didn't include the I-94. So they don't know what status you're in. Maybe you included an expired I-94 and forgot to include um, you know, the latest one. It could also be more indirect uh, and more nuanced, especially if the person is on, say, a student visa. Uh, if they're on F1 visa and if they're on CPT, curricular practical training. They often send RFEs about maintenance of status because they want to make sure that the person maintained their F1 status, especially if they have, they took day one CPT. Because they're like, okay, you're working and you're studying. How are you doing both at the same time? Show us that your course requires you to work as well as study. So that's that's a maintenance of status issue. Um, sometimes you may not include um, pay stubs if the person is already on a H1. Sometimes because you have to show that just showing the H1 approval, um, the uh, the um, one that is not uh, expired, the unexpired H1 approval is not enough. You have to show pay stubs that the person is actually working for that employer. So you need both. You need to show pay stubs to show proof of work and also the I-94. <clears throat> in some instances, they also ask for whether they were working in a specialty occupation or not. Meaning that we don't think you maintain status because you know you're. It looks like you're working as a, um, you know, computer programmer, and you know from the duties, it doesn't seem like you're working in the field that you're supposed to be working in. You said you, you know, as per your previous H1, you filed an LCA for a software engineer, but your duties look like you're working as a, you know, computer programmer. So show us that you maintain status. That could be a maintenance of status issue. Next slide, Visha. Now, availability of work. This is availability of work uh, in-house. So just as I said, work cannot be speculative. Uh, whether you are working in-house or you're in, in your office, in your employer's office, or you're working for a client, uh, no matter what, you have to show that there is availability of work. So oftentimes, consulting companies will uh, file H1s en masse for in-house projects. And USCIS is wise to that because this is a way for them to game the system. So they will just put in dummy projects, put in a project report, you put in information to show, oh, I have XYZ project. And the person is going to come and work for me there in that project. And then they will move the person to an actual project once they come here. So that's a trick that USCIS is very well aware of, so don't do it. Um, I'm not saying that you cannot have a genuine project. You can, but then you have to you have to show that it is a genuine project, and because USCIS is going to presume that it's a dummy project, so you have to show that you have, say, venture capital funding for it. You have to show that you bought software. You have, or maybe you have to show that you're already marketing the product. Or maybe you can show that you know it the product is already in market 
in the market and you have clients and you have SOWs. <clears throat> or you can show that the project has already started and you've already hired X number of people. And here are the screenshots. Here is the half completed work to show that the project is underway. Maybe you could show that you have um, patent on the project. So you have to show more than just a project report um, to prove that you actually have a project. And also it's important to note that hiring someone on a project, bringing them here and immediately uh, placing them at an end client looks, um, looks fishy and USCIS, <clears throat> if you do this on a regular basis, is going to question it. So again, something to um, keep in mind. Next. OK, so when you're filing the H1, <clears throat> there are a bunch of forms that you submit. Uh, you submit the I-129 forms, and then you also, along with that, submit an LCA. An LCA is short for labor condition application. Now, the labor condition application is a document um, that you get approved from the labor department. Nothing to do with USCIS. You submit the rest of the petition with USCIS, but after you get a pre-approval of the labor certification from the labor department. So in this document, you attest to the salary that you're going to pay the beneficiary. You attest to where the beneficiary will work. If they're working at a client site, you will name the client and give their address. And um, you, you have information about your company as well, your address, um, you know, telephone, biographic information, so on and so forth. So make sure that your LC is correct. Make sure that it corresponds with the information that you're actually putting down in the I-129 form, the USCIS form that you're submitting. Make sure it's signed. Um, so make sure your suite number is correct or the worksite address is correct. There's so many problems that can occur with an LCA. And the problem with the LCA is once you submit it, you cannot correct the LCA. You, they can't send you an RFE and you say, oh, OK, I made a mistake. Let me file a new LCA and get you a new one. You can't do that because the LCA has to be certified before the filing of the H-1B petition. So the, uh, your only um, recourse would then be to file an entirely new H-1B petition. So you can imagine the time that would be wasted by the time they send you an RFA and you realize there was a mistake. Most probably your opportunity uh, to get hired at that particular place would be lost just because of processing time, etc. And then the next. So another reason you could get an RFA and another reason uh, to uh, another uh, aspect to look into when you're filing a H-1B is your six year limit. Now, every H1, every person has a six year limit on a H1, which means they cannot be on a H1 for more than six years. Of course, there are exceptions to that. And in order to file the petition, if it is beyond six years, you have to show that you meet one of those exceptions. So you have to show that you have a labor cert uh, filed or I-140 filed and more than 365 days have elapsed. In that case, then you can only ask for an extension of one year. But you have to show documentation that you have one of those two things. So you have to either show um, an approved labor or you have to show a pending I-140 or a pending labor and you have to show that it's pending for more than 365 days. So you have to document it. Now you could, if you show an I-140 approved, you can get a three years extension instead of a one year extension if it's already approved. So in that case, then you'd have to give, submit the approved I-140. So that's also important to note. If you don't submit it, you'll get an RFA. Now, there might be many instances in which uh, maybe USCIS didn't calculate it correctly. So maybe you have six months left and you didn't really document how you have six months left, but you just put it in the petition and sent it out. They'll send you an RFE saying that, look, your first H-1 started on so-and-so date. Based on that, um, you know, your six years are over. But it could be that you spent six months outside the country. So that six months doesn't count towards your H1. So you, it's important to document that. Um, and always important, uh, better if you can prudent, if you can document that before uh, on, upon filing rather than on an RFA. 
So you have to basically um, take out photocopies of your passport and show your entry exit dates or go to the I-94 um, portal where your arrival, everybody has an I, there's an I-94 portal. If you enter your passport number, everybody can get a record of their entry and exits uh, into the US. So you can uh, submit that document as well to show that, you know, you spent XYZ number of days outside the country. Uh, or it could be that you change status in between and you were on a different status and then came back to a H1, but that's not evident to USCIS. So these are some important um, documents to include, include, especially if you know that on the face of it, um, your six years seem to have expired. Next slide, Visha. Fees. This is also, this seems to be like a no brainer, right? You know what the USCIS fee is, make sure you submit the right check. But you'd be surprised as to how many times there is an issue with the fee. Um, so sometimes the USCIS fee, um, the check that is submitted is returned by the bank because the employer isn't good for the check or something happened with the bank. Uh, in this situation, uh, USCIS will send a receipt for the fee uh, and they also might send um, an RFE. So um, in that instance, you have to submit a new check. So that's important to know. Um, make sure that your fee, your check is good. Sometimes the amount on the check might be wrong, either the words or the numbers. The check may not be signed. The check may be dated, post dated or predated. Uh, anything can happen. So, uh, so it's important when we send out a case, we look at every single column on the check to make sure it's correct. Uh, but it's still possible to sometimes miss things. And you know, so a check is very important. It's important to write the correct check. Of course, um, you have to know what the correct fee is. And um, the fee is not the same in every situation. And it's not the same for every company. So it depends on the number of employees. And out of that, how many employees are on H1. Um, it depends on whether you're filing an extension or a new H1. So the fees can differ uh, quite drastically. So it's important that you uh, look into the, look at the regulation, look at the USCIS website actually, and cross check what the fee is before you send out a case. Um, so again, if you don't understand something, you know, immigration attorneys are there to help you and they can guide you on what the correct uh, check should be. Next slide, Visha. Okay, now I think we've covered most of um, do's and don'ts on the RFEs and what to expect uh, on RFEs and what kind of RFEs you can expect, what documents have to be submitted if you get those RFEs. Also, there's some additional things that we want to bring to your attention to consider. Um, if you've received an RFE, um, that doesn't mean that your case is denied. Don't panic, right? It's just uh, a tool by which USCIS is able to learn more about your case. Sometimes they just have questions because it's not clear. It doesn't mean that they have an intent to, re to, to deny your case, no. They just, they just don't have enough information to process your case. So don't panic, it's fine. Uh, don't withdraw the case, you know, respond to it. So that's one thing. Second, um, now an RFE sometimes is not written. They don't really write RFEs in the best way. Um, they don't write it chronologically. Sometimes they're not writing exactly what they want. They use very indirect language. For us, we know exactly what they want because we see them, see these RFEs day in and day out. But if you're new and you haven't seen an RFE before, it might sometimes be confusing because the most important thing, they'll put it in a little, in a one line and the rest of it will all be garbage in the RFE. So if you miss that one line, you're actually missing the most important part of the RFE. So read the RFE really carefully. Read it two times if necessary to make sure that you're not missing something. So um, that's an important um, aspect to remember. Third, uh, the mailing address. Make sure that you send it to the right mailing address. The address is always given on the RFE. Sometimes a case might be transferred, you know, to a different 
um, location and you might not be getting the RFA from the same location that you sent the case to. So don't presume that you can just send it to the same service center that you sent your initial petition to. Always double check, triple check, make sure you're sending it to the right petition because if you don't and the RFE date uh, passes by, then you will not get an opportunity to then resubmit your case. Your, your case will pretty much be denied because there's no exceptions to the deadline. There is a deadline by which you need to submit your documents. And then that's a segue into the last part, which is uh, respond before the deadline. <laughs> Um, don't wait for the last minute. Uh, if you send it on the day before and you send it by FedEx and you think that, OK, FedEx next day delivery, it should go through fine. There's a rainstorm. It doesn't go through. It's in California and you send it after four o'clock. It'll most probably go two days later and then you miss your deadline. Something to keep in mind for during this pandemic is they have extend, extended. All RFE deadlines by 60 days. So that gives us some more breathing space. Uh, so whatever the deadline is on your RFE, you can you have another 60 days to send out your case. But again, calculate that 60 days carefully. Uh, it's not two months, it's 60 days. So make sure you have that correctly. Next, Visha. So you sometimes may not get an RFE. You may, might get a notice of intent to deny. Um, and you know, RFEs are issued, as I said, because there's something missing or they have further questions. Notice of intent to deny is what it says it is. It's an intent to deny the case because they find something serious. And before they're going, they have an intent to deny it. So this is panic. You have you need to turn the panic button on. Um, and you have to, they're giving you an opportunity to, to say why they should not deny it. So they're giving you an opportunity to rebut that and tell them that they're wrong in their findings. So very important to pay close attention to a notice of intent to deny. Usually an annoyed, as we call it. Um, usually it means that you'll have to refile the petition because these are issues that sometimes cannot be fixed. And that's why they send out these NOIDs. Uh, but and also something to keep in mind is they give you only 30 days to respond to annoyed. They give you much less time when compared to an RFE. So keep that in mind. Don't presume it's the same time as, you know, response time as an RFE. Next, Michelle. I think we're done. So how can we help? Um, as you can see, we work on different types of cases. We do family based cases. We do employment based cases. We do citizenship and naturalization. We do investor visas and green cards. Uh, we help students. Uh, we also file uh, visitor visa extensions. So whatever questions you might have, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, and we will help you resolve your issue, whatever it might be. Thank you, Prashanti. That was uh, very useful. I'll just uh, wrap this up within the next uh, few minutes as far, as far as the presentation is concerned. I just want to quickly talk about, uh, as Prashanti was uh, mentioning about the services that uh, we offer and how we can help you. Uh, we also would like to you know, address that uh, we have deep expertise and experience. Uh, we've been doing this uh, day in, day out for many, many years now, and uh, numbers uh, speaks for themselves. We have uh, successfully served uh, 1000 plus uh, clients. Uh, we are top rated. Uh, we are in fact one of the top 10 immigration firms in New York and adjoining areas. Uh, very high satisfaction rate and you can read our reviews either on Google or when you jump back to our website, raving client reviews that just uh, gives you a good idea as to uh, what you may uh, experience uh, in, in working with us. And uh, other than that, uh, <clears throat> the industry that we are in, it requires uh, um, keeping ourselves up to date. Um, and one of the, the ways that we identify ourselves as an expert is when we hear from others from within the industry and uh, outside. And awards and recognitions are uh, something that, uh, you know, is a good testimony of that. 
very recently, Prashanti has been uh, rated as one of the super lawyers. Um, so that again is a big testimony uh, to how we can potentially help with uh, your existing and ongoing uh, application requirements. So on that note, uh, I would open this up for uh, any questions that any of you may have. You can submit your questions either on on the chat or you can just raise your hand or drop a line on chat that uh, you would want to speak and we can unmute you. Uh, and while we wait for that, I would like to uh, go ahead and ask Prashanti a few of the questions that uh, are often uh, getting asked. Uh, one very common question is, uh, is it possible for an H-1B visa holder to start a firm in the US along with a citizen and then transfer H-1B to that particular company? Right, yeah, a lot of... Um... Entrepreneurs do ask me that uh, because they want to start up their own businesses. And as we all know, um, you know, the green cards take so long that they're stuck for years and years on a H-1B. Uh, so you have to do this carefully because, I mean, you can own a company on a H-1. Uh, you can invest in a company rather uh, as long as you're a silent partner. You can invest shares in Microsoft, right? Anyone can. So it's the same thing. You can own shares in a company, but you cannot actually work for that company because then you'll be violating your uh, visa status unless uh, you file a H-1 through that company and you know work that way as an employee. But then the problem comes up with the employer-employee uh, definitions when you're filing for a H-1. So the H-1 says that you know you the person who you're hiring has to be an employee and the, the person who is hiring has to be an employer. So there's a whole employer-employee definition there. And if you don't meet that definition because you're a, a part owner, then that becomes a problem. That is definitely an issue there. So you have to meet that requirement. And um, as I said, then as you said in your question, you, was, you were asking me whether they can file a H-1 through that company. I think that in that particular scenario, uh, filing a H-1 would be a stretch uh, because you are part owner of the company. Okay, Th thank you so very much, Prashanta, for that. Uh, I'll take another question. Uh, I'm currently on ninth year extension of H-1B. Is there any possibility to shift to a different company? Uh, if yes, what is the procedure? So, yeah, I mean, you can file for a H-1 transfer um, as long as you qualify for, um, you know, you have six years on a H-1. So you have to qualify um, for the exemption. Why do you not, uh, you know, so basically the way to qualify for the exemption of the six year limit is if you either have an I-140 approved, as I said earlier, or you have something filed, the green card filed and is in, um, has been uh, in progress for the last 365 days, which means has been filed 365 days ago. So if one of these scenarios is you, then you can definitely apply for a ninth year, 10th year, 11th year, and it doesn't matter if when you're applying, whether it's a transfer or an extension, uh, whatever it is, it doesn't matter then at that point. Okay, great insight that, Prashanti. Uh, next question I have is uh, uh, one of the live questions. I have J1 right now. Uh, is it possible to change it to H-1B? If yes, how? So yeah, you can file a change of status from a J-1 to H-1. But in order to do that, you have to see what your J-1 requirements are. Uh, is there a waiver? Do you require a waiver on your J-1? Is there a country condition that has to be met? Usually J-1s uh, will have restrictions and they'll say that, you know, you have to go back to your country for two years before you can you know, work on a different status. So they won't allow you to change status. But if you don't have any such conditions or if you, um, again, meet that conditions by working in an underserved area, if you file a waiver that is of those conditions, then of course, yeah, you can uh, file a change of status, but you can only do it when the cap opens up next year, unless you're working for a cap exempt organization, such as a nonprofit organization. Okay. 
good to know that. Uh, next, I mean, this is an ongoing thread here. Uh, the next question is, uh, I'm just reading it in scribbles. Uh, return to India on a particular date in 2018 through H1B. Validity exists till uh, 20th September 2019. So essentially one year plus. Since returned from US, I did entrepreneurship on non-software things. Uh, what extension can I get? Uh, I believe six years again, so it's more of a confirmation than a question, I guess. Yeah. Um, so if you've been outside the country for a year or more, then yes, you will get a fresh six years on your H1. Uh, but of course, uh, the disadvantage is then you would have to file under the cap again. So that means you only you won't be cap exempt. You'll have to file again next year uh, based on the cap. So yes, and uh, you know there's a good news there. You'll get to fresh six years. Bad news is you'll have to file during the cap. Okay, I hope that answers. We'll take just a couple of more and then we'll wrap up the session. Uh, and unfortunately, if you are not able to get through your question, what I would suggest is. Uh, you can drop us uh, your email and uh, someone from our team will reach out to you or you can go on our website and submit a contact us form. Um, the next question, Prashanti, I have is, can I apply for two H-1B transfers at a time? Um, so you can f file for a concurrent H-1. So you can file for one H-1 which is your regular H1 transfer. Once that gets approved, you can then file for a concurrent H1, which means that you want to keep the second H1 active as well. You could do it that way. So first H1, file it. Once it gets approved, then file for second H1 concurrent. Concurrent, okay. Got it. Uh, I'll take the last one here. Uh, one of... Uh, Stenman's friend filed H-1B for, for India. However, he got RFE for his business office in residential zone. Uh, how can he resolve this issue? Right, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> and we didn't go through that under the RFE, so I'm glad he asked it. <laughs> so a lot of companies, um, you know, startups, will start operations from home because that makes sense, right, from a financial <laughs> point of view not to take an office space until you're actually established. But from the USCIS point of view, that doesn't work that way. And um, they want to make sure that you have an office and you're following the rules. So if you're working out of home, is your home office zoned for commercial use? Uh, or is it not? And you're not following the zoning laws. So they, I don't know why they're so hell-bent upon uh, making sure it's a commercial space, but they want to make sure they want a commercial space. So if it's not, then maybe this person can now move um, and then show them an office lease and say that we are now in a commercial space and this is our office and this is the address and you know, give them a copy of the lease. That's the only thing. Or if they are in a, in a mixed zoning area, then they can give them the proof of that. Great. Wow, that was. Uh, that was an interesting one for sure. Um, OK, so we'll wrap the session up. And